1 Peter chapter 2, we'll start in verse 9. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Let's pray. Father, I pray for this time that we have now. Lord, that as we study your word, as we think through what this is, Lord, Lord, that this would not be the only time that we study your word this week. Lord, that you would give us a passion and a desire for your word, because your word is life, Lord. Let us not be those who seek a sign. Let us not be those who live by feelings. Lord, let us be those who study your word so deeply that it, it reacts within us, Lord, that your spirit uses it within us as we go throughout the, Lord, the trouble of life, the issues of life, the temptations. Lord. I thank you for your word, and I pray that you would use it this morning. It's in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So the very first thing you have in Verse nine, just kind of to step aside for a second, understanding what you're doing in verse nine, where you're nine through 12 here, it's a response to what has been presented already. Uh, it's, uh, I've tried not to use this word in, in a while because my kids make fun of me every time I use it, but it's a juxtaposition, sorry, uh, against what has been presented earlier in this verse. What you, you're seeing is this idea that this is what you are. This, this thing that you are as the church is the opposite of what everything else is in this world. The point that he's been getting is the same point that we shared last week. That the way that we live our life now, right now, is supposed to be different than the way that this world looks. The, the values that we hold should be different than the values that they hold. The, the way that we think about things should be influenced and infiltrated by God's word and by the Holy Spirit. Not by our feelings, not by what is culturally relevant, not by what the, the winds of change are blowing in. We should be steady based on God's word. So here in this, this passage, and just, just as, you know, to think through something, this whole new things kind of blowing in all the time, new, uh, what do you call that, trends? It's nothing new. It's the way that it's always been. There's always been a new thing. There's always been a new way to do things, always. And they're not always bad. A lot of times they're okay. But oftentimes, the way that the world is pulling you away from what Christ has laid out for your life you need to be on guard with that. He lays this out in here in verse nine. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. These three terms uh, are kind of interesting. If you go back, you look on Blue Letter Bible or you get out your, uh, your Greek, uh, you can look up what these words mean. Chosen race is eclectos, genos, uh, which means an elect kindred. Um, when you talk about the elect, that's what he's talking about here. Chosen, that you have been chosen out of this world. And that, that these things that he's naming about you, it's not attributes about you. This is who you are. If you are a follower of Christ, if you're in the kingdom of God, these are the things that are true about you. These, this is who you are. So the very first thing is you are a chosen race. Uh, you are a royal priesthood. I thought this one was, was pretty cool because uh, it's, it's basically like saying these two words together, king priest, <laughs> like king priest. I've been playing chess a little bit this week and the king is, 
I like the queen better. She can do whatever she wants. It's kind of like life, I think. Uh, the longer I'm married, the more I realize that. Um, but, you know, it's just, ooh. <laughs> um, but, but this is what he's, he's saying. He's like, he's combining these two words. When you translate one language to another, uh, if you have ever learned like a little bit of Spanish or a little bit of French, or uh, we had a, one of the teachers or somebody that was teaching a little bit of Italian, and she would just kind of tell us stuff. And the only thing I remember is, ci vediamo domani. And Jack is like, he likes to say it like that. And you had to move your hands because it's fun. But I don't even remember what it means. But there's ways that you say certain things that don't exactly line up in the other language. You, you have to understand a little bit about the translation in order to get what's going on there. So when he's saying royal priesthood, it's easy for us just to kind of pass that off as something that it maybe doesn't mean. What he's saying is like, you are literally the priest of the king. Like that is your job. You're no longer just people who exist in this world and do whatever it is that you're doing. Like you have a job now to be the priest of the king. What does the priest of the king do? It's like the go-between between the king and God. It, your job now is to take people into the presence of God. It's not just the pastor's job or the worship leader or, or your Sunday school teacher. Like your job is to take people to him. You are the priest of the king, a royal priesthood. Um, he, he lays out this. He says a holy nation. Basically just means a nation of saints. You see, we've been talking about this uh, through Galatians a little bit. Last week, we, we kind of went there a, a little bit, but here he's, he's really laying out exactly what this is. He's saying, this is the way that you were before. You were just like everybody else. You were in this world. Now you're not. If you are a follower of Christ, this is not home anymore. This isn't your nation. This isn't your thing that you belong to. I used to listen to, it was a Rush Limbaugh, I think, and his whole thing was border, language, and culture, right? Everything was about borders, language, and culture because that's what makes up a nation. We are a nation because we all basically live in the same place, we practice a lot of the same culture, and we speak mostly the same language. Lots of different dialects of that uh, as, we, <laughs> as we learn as you travel around. But that's what this is. And what he's saying about you as a nation is that that is what's true of you. The language that you speak now is different than it used to be. I always thought that just meant don't cuss. Don't talk about filthy stuff. Like, that's kind of the obvious stuff, right? I think for so long in our Christian life, we've stuck on just the obvious stuff. Like, as long as I didn't say any cuss words today, like, I'm good. That's all really that matters. But what he's talking about is a whole new lexicon about your speech. What you talk about is more important even than how you talk about it. It's everything. It's a change from, now I used to talk about all this stuff all the time. This is what I was about. This is the, the thing that came out of my heart was just this stuff. This is what I cared about. And it came out through the words that I said and how I used them. Now it's different. Now it's new. Now it's a whole different way of speaking. My culture, the way that I used to view the culture of my nation how people did stuff, and I just thought like that was normal. Now I'm a different culture. Now I'm a new creation. Now I'm a new culture, a different thing. That's what he's laying out here. He's saying don't, as he says in other places, don't let the culture influence you, infiltrate you, infiltrate the church. But you go out into the culture and infiltrate it. You are a new thing. So when he's laying this out, he says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. He says, a people for his own possession. It sounds kind of weird to us. I think to the Western ear, it's just a very strange thing, this idea of being a possession. But when you understand monarchy and kings and queens and how all that works, 
it's not the way that it is for us. You know, with democracy and with uh, you know, constitutional government, the way that we do things used to, maybe I would say used to, everyone had a voice at some level. If you really don't like what's going on in Laurel Hill, we can't. Uh, maybe some of you live actually in Laurel Hill, but we can, we can go, they don't care. But uh, you can go and stand before the, the city council and say what you think about it. Now they can say who cares and move on with their lives, but you can actually have a voice in that. If you really feel strongly about something in our nation, you can go and stand before Congress or your state representative. You can be represented in what you have to say. In a monarchy, it's not the way it works. You're beholden to the king. There's this, uh, this video of uh, one of the, the king of, I think it's Saudi Arabia. You're not allowed to touch him. And uh, it's from when Donald Trump was president, he walks by and he just taps him on the shoulder. And he's, you know, affronted by it because the different ways the cultures work are very different. To even touch him is just, it's a no-no. We understand how these things work. But it's foreign to us. So when he's saying that you are a people of his own possession, it's not in order to say like, well, he owns you and you can only do these things. It's not a, a term of you being stripped of all of your rights. It's a term of endearment that you are his. That the God of the universe, the one that owns everything, he owns you as well. He, he cares for you in such a way that he has, instead of being aloof to who you are, to standing off distant and not caring about you, that he has visited you, that he has made a way for you to come into his court, to be part of his kingdom. A people for his own possession. He says, why are you this? Why has he done this? What is he doing all of these things? He says, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The reason that he has done this, I, I've struggled with this over the years. I, I finally came to grips with it. And it's God saved you to demonstrate his glory. I was listening to a, uh, a pastor. I didn't say pastor. I don't, he's a an influencer, maybe that's a better word. And he was, he was laying out his case for why he believed that God actually worships us. <laughs> it's heretical blasphemy. I mean, you just, you intrinsically, you hear it and your guts go, oh, no, that doesn't sound right. But he's laying out this whole point of the fact that, that God finds all this glory in you because you are actually God is his, his whole point. It's the same lie that the Satan told Eve in the garden, right? It's the same point that Satan has proclaimed of what his point of view is, that he would ascend above the mountain of heaven, that he would ascend to his throne above the stars of heaven. He's always desired that worship. And he's laying it out in this culture more and more and more. It's being revealed more and more and more. And what this passage is telling you is saying, it's not why you exist. You don't exist to receive worship. He didn't save you because he looked out into the world and saw things that deserved it. He saves you because he loves you. And he loves you out of no obligation to you. Only because he loves you. Period. He loves us in such a way that it is Incredible. That's why he lays it out this way. He says, he called you out of darkness. He called you out of death. He called you out of being far away from him into his marvelous light. Not because he owed it to you, but because he loves you. We don't deserve any kind of worship. We don't deserve any kind of praise. Everything. All praise, all honor, and all glory goes to the King of Kings, period. The reason we have salvation is to demonstrate the glory 
an awesomeness of who God is. And I think sometimes this, this whole church and Bible and, and God thing becomes so, I don't know, old hat. Yeah, it's just kind of the, the way things are. It's, it's that shirt that's in your closet that you really like and you just wear all the time because it's comfortable and it fits the right way. And you're like, you know, I just know what I'm going to get there. I know how that is. It's comfortable for me. And when you really start to think about what this is, it makes you, at least it makes me feel a little weird. It makes me a little uncomfortable to think about my relationship with God. But it's not based on anything that I'll ever do. It's not based on whether or not I, I cuss or I don't cuss or I, I, I drink or I don't drink or I, I chew or I don't chew or I run with girls who do or I don't, you know, go see rated R movies or you know, whatever those things are. That was the culture that I was brought up in in church was don't do the bad things and that's the way that God is going to be pleased with you. I think we've gotten things backwards for so long. God is pleased with us because he has saved us. Period. He's pleased with us because he offered to us the blood of his son to cover our guilt and our shame and our nakedness. And now he's pleased with us because of what Christ has done, because of our place within that. The fruit, the, the, the lack of sin, the growth in Christ, the the holiness that is showcased in our life is the fruit of that. It's not the means. He says, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This, this word once here, it's easy to overlook. But he's saying that at a former time, at a time before this, right? When you think about how words work, it's a little weird. But he's saying in the past, you were a people who had not received mercy. What does that mean? It says that you were a people who were under his wrath. Wrath is not something that we like to talk about. It's, it's the thing that we very quickly brush aside because we don't like the idea that we were objects of wrath. When I first came to the conclusion that I was born with my fist raised in the air saying, not your will but mine, it bothered me. It was difficult for me to think through that, that I was a born rebel that the only cure that I could possibly have would be the blood of Christ, the sacrifice that, of Jesus. I would never work my way to it. I would never find it. That was a hard pill to swallow because it means that I can do nothing to assuage the wrath of God. It's, it's as if he's standing there looking at us in a scornful way, because we deserve it. Because we are standing and looking at him saying, no, I don't want you. And he says, instead of hammer to the face, you're done, you know, hell, whatever. He sends the blood of Christ, he sends his own son for exactly what we deserve. The death that we deserve, the, the punishment and the wrath that we deserve, that he laid all of that on Jesus. He provided the very thing that he commanded for there to be. So when he's laying this out, he says that at one time you were an object of wrath. Now you are those who have received mercy. When we stand before God, we stand before him humbly because we don't stand before him and say, God, look who I am. Look how great I am. Look what I've done. That's why you love me. We stand before him and we say, God, I do not deserve this, but you have been merciful to me. That's why we sing these songs that, that praise his name, because he deserves praise for who he is in general, but also because of what he has done for us. We are his people. 
That's not a downgrade. We're his people. That is the, the greatest position that we could ever have. A royal priesthood. This is once you were those who had not received mercy. Now you are those. Now you are those who have received mercy. It says, beloved, I urge you. These two words are kind of weird. He says, as sojourners and exiles, to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. These, these two words are uh, kind of in our, our lexicon right now. It'd be like aliens and strangers, uh, pilgrims. It, it's when you go back to uh, the way the Jewish world worked, right? If you were in your little, your Jewish community and you knew everybody because they all did the same thing, they all wore the same clothes, they all looked alike. And somebody walked into that community, what would you immediately know about them? You're not like us. You're not one of us. You are a alien. You are a foreigner. You are a stranger to this community. I didn't understand. I'm from Jacksonville, Florida, and it's very rare to even know, like, maybe you know two neighbors over. Maybe you know, like, somebody a block in your neighborhood or something like that. But further than that, you don't know anybody. It's just a bunch of strangers. <laughs> yeah, you're all just living in the same community, but you don't really hang out or do anything together. But in this community, you see a car that comes down the road that you don't recognize, what do you do? <laughs> yeah, he says, what's up? <laughs> Stop, I need to talk. You, but you, you look at it, you watch what's going on, especially where y'all live. If somebody's coming out there <laughs> that's intentional. Uh, but, but you know that something's different about it immediately. It's not just like, hmm, that's just people that live here I've never met. Like, that's somebody different. That's, that's somebody that's alien to this community. It's a stranger. He's saying that once this is who you were, you, you were an alien outside of the commonwealth of God's kingdom. That there was a time where you stood afar off where the kingdom of God existed and you were outside of it. And what he's done for you now is not to just save you and leave you in that you know, outside community. He saved you and brought you in. That he saved you in such a way as to make you a part of the kingdom. And why did he do this? Because he loves us. He wants us to be in community with him. He wants us to be in communion with him. That's what he desires. And even beyond that, he gave us this crazy thing called the church to be in community with one another, that God's kingdom exists together at a place that's physical and has location and time. That's why we exist as the church is not just so that we can enjoy the stuff and be entertained and have a social you know, gathering. We exist because we are God's kingdom here on earth. It's like a beachhead in a foreign hostile territory. It's such a different concept than what I think oftentimes we think of this as. This is enemy territory that we live in. When you become a follower of Christ, it's not as if you just become somebody that has an extra little something in your life. You go from one side to the other. You go from an enemy to a friend. You go to, from those who are outside under the wrath of God that are foreign, that are aliens, that are hostile, to those that are in. That's why it's so important that we gather together as the church. That's so why it's so important that as we live in our families, that it's, it's not simply we do our individual stuff and we move on. The way that we raise our kids, the way that we think about all of this is that we're instilling in our families and our communities and those that are around us the values of the kingdom of God. We're demonstrating that our life aligns with values that are not 
the values of this world. That just because people outside say such and such is right, that we test that against the word of God rather than our own feelings even. That we live by his word. Once you were a stranger, once you were an alien, now you're in. He says, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain. So as you are a pilgrim in this world, as you are an exile from that world now, used to you were an exile from the kingdom of God, now you're an exile from that kingdom. You've been kicked out. They're not going to let you hang out. If you demonstrate the light of the Holy Spirit living within you, if you demonstrate values that line up with the kingdom of God rather than that, they are not going to let you hang out with them. They will not accept you anymore. And if they do, it's a little weird. I think for a long time we've tried to straddle this fence between the two worlds. We try to be in the kingdom but also just kind of hang out there too because it's comfortable and we're used to it and we know the rules and how it works. What he's calling us to is a full commitment to being his 100%. Not to having a foot in each camp, but to being his. Part of that means that we have to step, uh, it's not part of it, I I try to hedge, but I, I shouldn't hedge. It's not part of it, it's the whole thing, is to step out of that kingdom and into his kingdom completely. To align your values with the kingdom of God. And that means studying his word. That means asking him. He gives us the Holy Spirit to live within us that gives us discernment for what's going on in this world. There's there's something that happens that we just automatically know. Like, ooh, that feels weird. I feel awkward in this situation now where I didn't used to. I don't I don't mean to say it in a way that is is condemning or condescending or anything like that, but if you are comfortable in this world with its values and its stuff, you you should check that. There might be a problem there. We can't be comfortable here and in line with him because the two things are opposed to one another. He didn't give us the blood of Christ just so that we could have cleansing and then live in the world that he's already told us that we need salvation from. He's not just saving you from hell. He's saving you from the kingdom of darkness. He's saving you from, what does he say? He says, uh, he saved you out of, he called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He's not simply just saying, like, here's your no, no more hell stuff. Like, you don't have to suffer. But you can just continue on doing the things that you want to do. He's saying, you were in darkness, and now I'm bringing you into light. Light exposes. Light shows what's going on. He's called us from one and into the other. He says, to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. That's where that understanding where the the spirit living within us demonstrates the, the things that are going on in this world that wage war against our soul. The things that are going on in this world that are dragging us away, trying to bring us and pull us back into darkness. When we're exposed to those things, when we see it and we understand it, Take an axe to it. I don't know any other way to say it. Wage war against that. I think we have become too comfortable. This is not me sitting down to you. This is me right there with you. We've become too comfortable with this world. It's like we're on friendly terms with the enemy. We watch things on television that we know, we know we shouldn't watch. We listen to things and we say God's full of grace and he just gives it, you know, we can just do whatever we want. He'll forgive us. It's fine. 
We go to places we shouldn't go. We read things we shouldn't read. We do things that are aiding and abetting the enemy's desire to pull us away. I'm telling you, wage war against it. When you see it and you understand it, turn it away. I don't have my phone in my pocket, but I tell you what, that phone, <laughs> the things that are there, not just the like really like icky stuff that's obviously icky, but the stuff that's like on Facebook where you're arguing about things and you're so angry about stuff, politics and culture. I'll tell you, I, I, I was convicted years ago. I, I came, somebody said it, I don't remember what it was. They said, if you walk into this world and you are confronted by, you know, whatever it is, whatever cultural thing you know, bothers you, and you are not immediately reminded of how far from God you were, how little of his grace you deserved, there's a problem. When we're confronted by the world that we see as being evil, it's good to understand that it's evil. But it's also, it's really good to remember that you were part of it. And he didn't save you because of how good you were, how culturally right you were, how American you were, or patriotic you were, or how you know, happy or smart or whatever. He saved you because you needed to be saved and he loved you. Loves. It's continuing. It says in verse 12, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that they, when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. That day of visitation there is a, <laughs> I don't like that, that phrase. It's, it's the day when, there's coming a day where God is going to judge this world. Every person, everything, all, all of it, he's going to judge it. And there's a, a moment where you will stand before him. Those that don't know Christ will stand before him in a different way. Because they'll stand before him in a way that is condemned, under wrath, have not received mercy. Those that have received mercy will stand before him and plead the blood of Christ. And I believe that he is going to ask us, what did you do with it? Just like he did with the, in Matthew, where he gives the parable of the talents, right? The guy gives them the gold and says like, hey, take this stuff, invest it, use it, you know, make, make more. What does he do to the, the, the servant that didn't do anything with it, buried it in the ground? Take his stuff and give it to that servant and get him out of my sight, right? That's a rough thing. We are those who have received something that is so valuable. And yet oftentimes we bury it in the sand. Oftentimes we just simply continue with life as if it's normal. <clears throat> We crave the acceptance of the rest of the world so strongly that it overcomes our understanding of who we are. I think it's time for a lot of us, myself included, that we would repent of that, that we would turn away from it. Not just because there is judgment coming, but because the simple fact that he loves us and we love him that we desire to showcase who he is to the rest of the world because there is coming a day where they will die and be judged and the wrath will be on them. They will pay for their own sins. That makes me sick. I mean, it, honestly, it, it makes me feel sick to my stomach when I have the answer when I know what it is, I have become very convicted. I, over the years of working in youth ministry, and just I've become very convicted 
of myself and, and those that are around me in the church that desire to live in the same way that everyone else lives, to do all the same stuff, to have all the same values, to, to just build up this, this kingdom that's here in the way that they want to build it up, knowing that they've got an escape hatch, believing that there's, you know, I'm going to do all the same stuff, but at the end I just get to do, like I get the get out of jail free card, right? So I can hang out with them, I can do all the same stuff, I can affirm their lifestyle and their choices and their stuff and their values. And then when the judgment comes, I get to say, see you. Thanks for the memories, right? We are called into something different. We have been given mercy. Let's demonstrate to this world. It doesn't say if they accuse you of evil, if they call you bad people, if they say bad things about you. It says when they do. The values of this kingdom that we belong to do not align with the values of the kingdom that we currently live in. The two things don't they don't hang out. You know what I'm saying? They're going to call you all kinds of names. But if you do the work of the gospel, if you do what he's called you to do, if you're actually doing good in this world, it's like they're going to call you evil, but they're going to be like, but it's weird because everything they do is good. Like they bring value to the world. And I don't like what they say. I don't like what they believe. The, the question that I'll, I'll end with today is a question for me. I think it's a question for all of us. Which kingdom do we live in? Which kingdom do we claim? I, I guess is the way to say that. I grew up in a divorced home. My parents uh, got divorced when I was a year old. I don't remember how long they were married. Maybe like two years. I don't know. But uh, I grew up in, <laughs> this sounds so weird, and I don't mean it. I love you, mom and dad. You know, but I grew up in dueling kingdoms, right? Oftentimes enemy territory. <laughs> Uh, I remember Christmas was where that became very obvious because one would buy something that the other wanted to buy, and then it was on. Uh, and sometimes I was the beneficiary of that, right? You just keep getting more and more. Uh, but I understand what it feels like to live within two kingdoms, right? Two places that you know how to, how to live over here and you know how to live over here. You know what's acceptable here and you know what's acceptable here. Intrinsically, we know how to live within the cultures that we're in. The question for us now as followers of Christ is which kingdom are we going to align our lives with? What values are you going to say, I believe? No matter what, no matter what this culture does, no matter what president there is, no matter what America or Tanzania or Mali or you, wherever you are, no matter what they do, no matter what they say, I can go no further. I will stand on the rock on the values that he's given me. Period. That's it. Do what you must. Where are we at? What do we believe? This isn't a thing to say everybody feel guilty and do the right thing now. This is really let's inspect our lives. Let's ask God through the Holy Spirit to reveal to us to convict us of those areas where we are making compromises, where we're far too comfortable. Let's ask him to make us uncomfortable. Not just in this stuff, but in our laziness often, in our inaction, in those opportunities where we have the ability to share with somebody and we don't. So we're scared of what they might ask us. We're, we're scared of them pointing to our own lives and being able to say, like, well, you don't do anything different than I do. Let's ask for him to convict us and forgive us and to give us passion and desire to see people receive mercy. Not to build a church, but to build a kingdom. Let's go forward with this. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for 
the mercy that you have given us. Lord, I thank you that you have called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. Lord, I thank you that we are your people. We are a royal priesthood. Lord, I thank you that we are your own possession. Lord, that you cherish and you love. I thank you for that. I pray that as we consider, Lord, which kingdom we are going to align with. Lord, that you would call us into yours. You would convict us of those areas where we have grown too comfortable with the enemy kingdom. So we've made compromises. Lord, convict us of that. Not just make us feel bad, but convict us. Lord, I pray that we, as Ebenezer Baptist Church, as as individuals that are here, Lord, as your bride, Lord, that we would demonstrate, Lord, our desire to align our lives with who you are, your values, and what you've called us, what you've said about us, Lord. Help us to seek, Lord, and search the scriptures so we can know what it is that you desire from us. Help us to stay on our faces and pray, Lord, for you to reveal, Lord, opportunities to share, Lord, your witness with those that are around us. Lord, make us uncomfortable in this world. Help us to think about our plans, our money, our stuff, Lord. Help us to turn our lives completely towards you. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. All right. Um, one last thing before we go. Uh, I've been talking about a little bit in deacons meetings and stuff about growing the church and um, all that. And I just want you to know I have been doing my part uh, growing the children's ministry specifically. Um, Natalie's pregnant. And so there's going to be one more of us. <laughs> uh, so... She's 12 weeks, almost 13 weeks. So around the beginning of October, end of September, there will be one more little books person running around here. Uh, so if you would, uh, please pray for um, me. Because, uh, <laughs> uh, no, pray for Natalie as a uh, you know, sickness and all of that stuff. Um, do pray for me as well, because... Uh, it's a lot, but uh, thank you guys for allowing us to serve with you. We love you guys, and uh, I hope you have a good day. There, just click on the thing. <laughs>
Because that's the one that is that that's that on the green thing. Oh, she down here. That's the one that I couldn't know. Are you ever seen all the on the blue line? Are you ever seen all the features on the
looks fine, but then you lose the couch. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, it's like a whole dog. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but, uh, how many do you think they have? Like, oh, three? That seems crazy. Seven. They have seven huskies. Oh, <laughs> they both work full time. Yeah, yeah. 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 Y
few uh, wildcats that kill for pleasure. Like they Weird. enjoy it. That's yeah. their thing. Um, like lions and tigers, they really only kill for food. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the jaguars, they they kill just because they like it. It's a true thing of the jungle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Dude, it was so big, dude. Yeah. That's not just all human when you look at their, uh, like their legs are just like, mm. We always, me and Beth always have this argument because she thinks it's so funny. And I'm like, she's like, how many animals do you think if you got put in a cage with you would survive? Like, there's not. Like, a lot of things at the zoo, sure, my, my dumb man brain, I'd probably, I'd, I'd try. <laughs> yeah. I'd definitely be like, well, there's a few of those things. I don't think I'd get very far. No. No. It's a different, uh, it's like if you've ever been fishing and catch sharks. Even like a, a pup, a oh, yeah. when you're holding it, you realize real quickly, like, it's just muscle. Oh, oh, yeah. instinct, but it, we call it a, now these guys talk to uh, eagle brain sometimes. I was trying to hold it. I used to actually work out and it was, my hands were strong and stuff. But I was holding it, and I'm like, with everything I had to the heat, number one, pulling that foot through is like oh, yeah. shoe leather. But uh, me trying to keep it from moving was not. I mean, there's yeah. nothing you can do. Yeah. It's just gonna do it the, uh, the fucking the little caimans, yeah. the alligators. Yes. I held one uh, at the zoo, and you have to hold its tail underneath your arm because if it moves that tail and you're not holding it, it's gonna it's gonna get out. Yeah. You don't have a chance. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, animals are. Uh, there's a like a I can't remember what it was, but somebody was talking about different. I was on probably Joe Rogan. Uh, he was talking about fighting a. Was a chimpanzee, you know, which they don't look imposing oh, really, but they will rip your face off. They will rip your like a gorilla can rip you in half. Oh yeah, uh, it's, without even trying. Really. Yeah, that's a different kind of uh, just a different strength altogether. But you know, there's these uh, there's these stories. It's crazy. There's these two dudes. I think it was in I want to say it was in Michigan recently. There's these two guys that fought a grizzly bear killed it because they, they were in like a survival situation yeah. and they had to kill this thing or it would die. I was like, there was how a do you? California that killed one uh, with a pocket knife. Yeah, you gotta be. He said every time it would lunge, you just da, 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 and then get away from it. And uh, I think it got him a couple times, but uh, when it when it finally died, its tongue was severed. Like it, I mean, he had just, it was a three inch gone out of yeah. The first email in my uh, Gmail account, my friend, uh, I got a friend from Ukraine, this is Oleg Boyarovsky, and uh, he's a super cool guy. Uh, we used to go to church together, and he sent me this email, and it's uh, a guy in Alaska that got attacked by a polar bear, and it shows the, the pictures of him, what it did to him. He ended up killing it, and got to his brother and shot yeah. it. But, uh, it's like you can see his skull, it flipped the top of it, it literally flipped his wig. Uh, oh, yeah, it, it's right here, like you just see the tendon and then the bone, and everything else is gone. His whole back is just like, it didn't actually like play it open, but it was. Oh, yeah, they say if you see, see like grizzly bears play dead, you know, brown bears trying to be big, if you see a polar bear, just you should dead. try. Yeah. Try it, and you <laughs> can <laughs> survive. <laughs> I was like, Whatever uh, you gotta do. Even when we were in Tennessee, it was uh, we lived on uh, Buffalo Mountain, was right across the street, and between Buffalo Mountain, like the past there was known for black bears. And black bears are not super scary. I mean, just no. realistically, it's like a giant or a kitten. But when you're out there by yourself and you start hearing stuff in the woods, oh, they don't follow that. You know, deer kind of through the woods, you hear it, but it's not loud. Okay, I'll be here. Bears just like, oh, <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> Uh, we're very curious too. Yeah. yeah. I was up on, I used to cycle a lot. I was up on that pass and uh, I had gotten all the stuff except for the shoes. I never got the uh, shoes that clip in or anything. And my shoelaces come with time, so I was up there soft and waiting for a minute. And I started hearing something like coming up through the woods. It was probably a raccoon. But you know, when you're already caught out, oh, yeah. uh, I jump on that bike. My shoelaces are like flapping, <laughs> and it's straight downhill, like, like, you know, you climb a thousand feet uh, going up that side. 
And so it's all just down, and then these hairpin turns back and forth. And I was not using brakes. I was uh, like trucking down the floor. My shoelaces got all tied. I was like, oh. But I was just trying to get away. And it was probably that thing. There's a video of this girl, uh, I think it was in Utah or something, but she's snowboarding down this mountain. And she's the only one up there, and she's got like a GoPro, and then she's got her earbuds in. Yeah. So she starts snowboarding, and you see behind her, a grizzly bear is like coming after her. Oh, She didn't yeah. even notice, because she had her earbuds in, and she wasn't paying attention behind her. So this and is you see her just carving, <laughs> carving down this mountain, and the grizzly bear is chasing her. Luckily, she hits this little like, uh, this little like ramp off, and she comes off of it, hits it, and she goes way faster. Yeah. And you see the bear on the top of this thing, like, oh, all right, whatever. But she and <laughs> she posted it, and she goes, survived the bear attack today, didn't even realize it was a bear. bear. Awesome. I just saw a video of a guy, like, in the water, and he had, like, one of those big underwater cameras, you know, yeah. that you hold with two hands. And I guess he had something in his ears, and his you could see an alligator coming and swimming up. I mean, oh. coming right. He was zero clue. Somebody was filming from above him somehow. And he was like underwater looking. He was like up by a plant or something. Then all of a sudden he catches that alligator from his side. <laughs> turns around like kicks towards the alligator oh. and swim away. But that gator was just oh, coming man. up right behind him. Yeah, I don't mess with water. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so I like I'm I like lakes. I've been in them, I've done the oh, see, but, all of this no, stuff. See, that's where you go wrong. You know, I'm an anti-lake because she's I She's an ocean that. person. Oh. Which doesn't make any sense. It does I mean, make sense. I we did I grew up on the river, we did yeah. lakes and we did the yeah. ocean, we did everything. Yeah. I don't know, I just I don't know, I don't know why <laughs> alligators are scarier to me than sharks somehow. Because I feel like you can survive a shark fight. But an alligator is just going to kill you. Like, he's going to drag you to the bottom of the lake wow. and you're going to die. I don't want either. I don't want either. No, I don't yeah. either. I don't <laughs> either. But I guess, like, my whole life I've been swimming in the ocean and I've seen a shark one time, like, ever. Yeah. Not that I've never seen them, but close yeah. to Yeah, each, each is a little different, too. Like, if you go, like, far out in the ocean, right. what's really the chance that anything? In this very specific exactly, part. that's what I'm saying. And but alligators, meh. Oh yeah. There's a, what was it like? Yes. <laughs> Whatever the the people who go out in the and they they have these things that they would create to go out and swim out in the ocean. And they I think we're thinking like, oh, what's the chance of them being out here? And so they all jump in. And they're swimming around, and a tiger shark comes out of nowhere, and uh, it takes the one girl's arm off. Huh. But, uh, you know, all of a sudden, it's, you see all these hippies like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my <laughs> gosh. Well, that's uh, the thing. Sharks are like, they always say, oh, sharks are just curious. They're, they're not trying to eat you. But if it's curious enough, yeah. it's going to take a layer off right. Right. Yeah. immediately. It's, <laughs> yeah. like, it's like, there okay. are things that are curious that could accidentally get it. Accidentally. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, it's, it's pretty crazy. There is a, uh, uh, and how would you remember like that? Yeah, see, yeah. Don't like that. I knew there was that on your ear. No, was... but recently someone just posted a video and it's kind of big. So I'm like, no, I no. Know. I, care, I think I care less about alligators than I do snakes. I think alligators are more snakes. Are snakes are yeah, snakes yeah. are no good. Like water moccasins? Yeah. Like, when I was, a little, I was a little kid, I was real country when I was a little kid, my dad told me, he said, yeah, we went to the lake and I look over. And you had, you were like down in the, the creek bed uh -huh. kind of area, and you were just messing with something. I was like, he's like, Nate, what are you doing? What are you doing? I said, look what I got. <gasps> and I picked up a water box oh, by his no head. Way. His head. And I was like, look what I got, I got one. <laughs> he's like, oh, bring it over here. <laughs> put it in, put it yeah. in. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, stop picking stuff up. <laughs> Just all the stuff. <laughs> just stop. Just stop <laughs> don't it up. Don't pick any of the stuff. That is so funny. He's like, he's like, you were fearless as a kid. I don't know what you. He's like, kids are dumb. Didn't care. I mean, kids are just. You know, they're I guess you just don't know. You know. Exactly. Like, we were now it's like I wouldn't even get close to that stuff now. But. We were over here at uh, Yellow River. And the kids were swimming. I don't know how many people. It was just me and a 
Hudson and Amelia and Tracy, I think, actually. Uh, but they were slamming in all of a sudden. And it's not real deep. And sometimes it gets deeper. But uh, I sat there watching them and kind of looking around. And uh, actually, what's his name? It stops, stops talking to me. But uh, I see this snake, and it was gigantic. Probably that big. And it's just cruising across the top of the water. But it's, you know, for me to the doors are a little bit further away. So I didn't say anything to them, but I immediately was like, okay, we need to. <laughs> Let's get everybody out of the water. This whole thing out. <laughs> <laughs> we did see an alligator out there in the river. Me and uh, one of the guys were kayaking. And we've been looking for one the whole day. It's, you know, it's like six hours between yeah. uh, four and two. <clears throat> and we kept looking on these like the sandy banks and they would sit there. It would often some marsh. But its head was a little bit of a way. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. I hope certain things with sharks scare me. Yeah. But they said, oh, folks have this kind of a Yeah. Like a grizzly bear. My buddy used to do that. He used to free dive. Yeah. And he had a lot of friends that used to free dive. And he was showing me these videos of these sharks, like just right next to him. Mm. Yeah. Just coming up to him. He's like, yeah, you just, you just poke him with the thing.
care more about your mom. He's like, if we're, if we're in a situation, you better run with me. Because <laughs> I'm taking care of your mother. I'm not taking care of your mother. I said, if you see me running, you <laughs> should be running too. I don't run. <laughs> not that I hate oh, running. No. Yeah, yeah. If I'm running somewhere, you, yeah, yeah. you should go it's with serious. me. It's serious. There's a problem in the other direction. <laughs> I had got some sneakers. I uh, posted a picture of them uh, on Facebook or something. And my friend was like, hey, he was willing to try something. I said, hey, uh, we can go running together. Like, never. Never. <laughs> never. If you ever see me running, you better stop what you're doing and <laughs> get in line. There's a reason they made cars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I don't have to run everywhere. <laughs> that was, uh, I remember Francis Chan is a pastor, uh, but he was saying that he remembers watching the uh, commercials for joining the military. He's like, I hate running. Like, I, you know, oh, I hate and he made this analogy of like, you know, joining the military, you're like, yeah, but I don't want to be that far. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> No, I don't think you last very long. <laughs> I feel like that's like ninety percent of what you do at first. Oh God! Is my so <laughs> funny story about that one. My NCO, he's been in the military for eighteen years now. He he grew up in it, right? Well, he started in like a force con unit, which is like real army. Yeah. Here we're kind of spoiled. We don't do a lot of that stuff. <laughs> but he was in the real army for a while, and he said he said his first thought coming into the army was like, oh, we're going to work out. Well, we're going to be big and strong. And he's like, then we ran every day. And he's like, there isn't this much running in the world. Yeah. Like, there's not this much running to do. <laughs> he's like, by the time we got to Friday, I had ran 20 to 30 miles. And that was just for fun. Like, there was no purpose behind it. He's like, I thought I was going to get strong. No, I just ran every day. <laughs> To break you mentally, you know, you just, your brain is like, this is stupid. Why are you doing this? Now, now the army has gotten better about like, okay, you do need some strength and like you do need some other things, but still, the amount of running they do, it's dumb. Yeah. So, I mean, what situation? If I'm getting shot at by anybody and I'm shooting back at them, there is no scenario <laughs> in which I need to run two miles yeah, just jump at, like, at an eight minute pace. You know, like, <laughs> if the adrenaline's pumping, I'm gonna get where I need to get. Yeah. Right, yeah. I watch uh, Grant, um, and he was talking about uh, combat evasion in yeah. different situations. And he was like, you know, it's not a, like a steady jog away. He's like, you immediately, if you're in this situation, you're spotted or whatever, he's like, it's just, Flat out as fast as you can run, sprints oh, yeah. and, you know, as far as you can go. Uh, there's not a, like, okay, let's have oh, a nice speed. Wait a second, I'm going to put my backpack up. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I got yeah. to, I had to, I had to break it to some of these younger soldiers that your job is to shoot at people and get shot at. Yeah. And they had, ne had never crossed their mind. What? That was That's a possibility. Weird. Yeah. But it's, you know, we're not in a war right now. Yeah. And these kids are, they, they join and they're like, we'll get you get free college, you know, we'll send you to Florida, like you'll have a good time, yeah. whatever. So they get here and I'm like, yeah, that's, that's part of your job. And they're like, what are you talking about? They're like, you've been shot? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's part of the job. That's <laughs> what I signed up for. about the like military. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, in your contract, it doesn't clearly say you will get shot at, but it's implied. Yeah. yeah. It's implied that you die. It must be a generational thing. It is. Because yeah. it I mean, that's all I would think yeah. is no well, one. We grew up in like Desert Storm. Yeah. 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 It's very, very different. different. 100 yeah. years about Thanksgiving. And uh, I remember when I was like that age, and even I thought about it, you know, because yeah. I grew up in Jackson, but everything is just like here. Everything's military. Yeah. Well, it's all right. Navy and yeah. uh, a lot of Navy aviation and uh, that sort of thing. But uh, you, you always are seeing something having to do with the military. And so, you know, you think about it because I didn't know what exactly I was going to do. And uh, then I had all these friends that went over and immediately, like, you know, when they started coming back, yeah, that's that. you're just like, wow. Oh, yeah. it's, it's not a. You're not just hanging out over there. No. It's, uh, it's terrifying. I, I joined a, just just late enough to still, or just early enough to still like go and do it, and then just late enough to really not have to do all of the crazy mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. But um, it's 
So <laughs> it's so funny. It, 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 I say kids, some of them are older than me, John, and it's, it's fine. But they're still, but yeah. they're still like brand new to life, you know. Right. So I have to give them this reality check. Like this is, this is what you signed up for. Yeah. <laughs> if we go in the next four years of your contract, and I'm like, hey, buddy. You're coming with me. <laughs> you got to come with me. I don't know what to tell you. And I'm like, if you don't start shooting back, I'm going to start shooting at you. So you'll get some. <laughs> <laughs> get some I don't understand how people, like, I don't know. I like history. Uh, I like military stuff uh, quite a bit as far as the history of war. And all that. <laughs> but uh, you know, the first time I ran is like, if they started shooting the people that were, you know, turning away in cowardice, like, wait a second, hold on. <laughs> So you're just a sandwich of death, <laughs> like you're either you're yeah. shooting or you're getting shot. You're either with me or against me, brother. That's what you got. You are, you are an asset or a liability. Yeah. 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 You know, like well, that we're we're mean to them now. It's very the generations have changed. Yeah. So I almost got I almost got in trouble the other day because I smoked this kid. He lied to me straight to my face, and I had not been doing exercise. <laughs> we were, he was going through it. But I was very nice. I had he was cold outside, so he had his jacket with his hands doing push-ups, and he had water the whole time, and whatever. When I was getting smoked, it was like right. it was like I'm gonna kill you. Yeah. Yeah. You're yeah. gonna die here. You, <laughs> <laughs> you believe that you were probably <laughs> I, was, I, I was just trying to survive. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you know, no one's even gonna know I died. <laughs> <laughs> no, I remember when I, I skipped PT one morning. Because I thought nobody would notice, uh -oh. and I went, because I, I went out there for the formation, they called my name, and I was like, all right, I'm going to go back to my room and get some more sleep. <laughs> Me and a couple friends. <coughs> this drill sergeant came out of my room, he goes, Daddy. Yeah. I was like, oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> He's like, outside, rocks, now. Oh, that was it. God. That's all he had to say to me. And I go out there, and it wasn't like, you know, you your dad gets mad at you, or somebody's mad, and they start screaming, and they like tell you what you did. He didn't say anything to me. It was just push ups, sit ups, run. Like, that's the only words he said to me, and I was just, how long are we doing this? That's for? worse. How often? Worse. <laughs> what's, yeah. what's going on? Is this ever going to end? I remember, I was in so much pain, it was just like, I don't care what he does to me at this point, just please stop making yeah. me do this <laughs> exercise. <laughs> you just get the PC. you start beating me up, whatever. Yeah, oh, never, never, <laughs> never. Pain is a good teacher. I uh, found. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah. I said when we, you know, I don't like spanking the kids, but it's like it's part of our life. Yeah, and uh, I'm like, I want this to hurt enough so that you remember it, but not that like I'm hurting you in a bad way. Well, you know, I don't want to hurt you. It's right. just. This is the thing that's going to, next time you think about doing that, you're like, hmm, I remember these things a little bit. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's, it's good to have some, uh, I don't know. You've got to have some consequence. Yeah. And, you know, like, as a, as a grown man, being told that I'm going to be doing push-ups for the next 20 to 30 minutes yeah. straight, I was like, you know what? I am done. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe I'm not going to do this again. Yeah, you I don't like how this makes me feel. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> Bethany working today? Oh, yeah. Uh, They're busy over there. Uh, yeah, it's spring break. Right. We yeah. should live through. They've had 650 people. Whoa. Uh, wow. Oh, yeah. And, and the weather's been so nice. Yeah. Oh, I know. It's yeah. been nice. I know. Plus, I got the kids' camp coming up, too. So, yeah. so you know, she just calls me. She's trying to. I wonder where you are. <laughs> she was just supposed to do produce today. Oh, okay. So it won't be a full day? Yeah, I hope not. Yeah. yeah. Plus, her car's going to be uh, getting worked on right now. So she's like, she's oh. Yeah, it's the natural state. Yep, that's so right. I've had. Helen fought me into one too many. I was like, I do not want another bolt. I still have one. You couldn't tell her nothing. No, no oh, he would still get another one. I know. I'm like, literally, literally all, all the time. All I do is mess up all the time. Well, it's not even, and even if it's like nice, if one thing messes up, that's right. I got I got call some European that's mechanic right. to come yes. down here and fix this well, thing. In Jacksonville, it wasn't as big a deal because you could go to yeah, like there was like, yeah, there was like yeah. Yeah. but here, I mean, I they had never heard of Volkswagen. And you talk to people here, like, what's that? Yeah, <laughs> we don't have a Yeah, there's a there is a 
place in Fort Walton, so it's like an Audi, Volkswagen, whatever, yeah. type of mechanic. And they are like, that's their thing. Yeah. But I'm not going to Fort Walton yeah. to do that. <laughs> so if, if they want to take my car to Fort Walton to get it fixed, that's probably not going to uh, The guy uh, up here, uh, if you're going to Fort Allen, <clears throat> on the left, uh, like a independent shop. Yeah. He's real honest, real nice guy, mm -hmm. good prices. I don't know if he works on Volkswagen, but... I, it seems like I've seen, like, everything. Like, a horse was there one day. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, just, just no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he is a good mechanic, though. Yeah. Uh, he's... Yeah. Guys, yeah. you need to let him go for yeah. the audio pickup, I don't know, we'll see. We'll see what she says. Also, I'm very hungry. Yeah. <laughs> Natalie, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Tell Bethany we said hey. Oh, for sure. Y'all have a good week. Yeah, you as well. See you later. Hey, Nelly, don't let me forget. I need to bring that uh, the money bag. Oh, this is still a okay. <laughs>